Thank you for auditing Professor Sky's record review, the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor in the fading light of a Rochester winter night. I'm going to be reviewing an album by Black Country New Roads called For the First Time, and this is one of the most requested uh, albums on this channel, and it's funny because I'd never even heard of the band. Doing my intentionally limited research, I discovered a few things, such as, did you know that this is the best band in Britain? Or according to another publication, the best band in the world? This is what was said about them after they had released two songs. So I think there's a fair amount of pressure on them for this album. I think in a way we can think of them as another band in this series of victims of the British press. To Britain's credit, they have a great interest in young, new rock and roll bands. To England's detriment, they are sort of like vampires trying to suck on young blood. Just, you know, what can we get? What can we get from these young people to prove that we're still who we think we are? I think, though, what makes this band a lot better than a lot of those groups, The Next Great British Hope, is that the reason that they're so interesting and the reason that I think people flock to them is not because of their affect. There's no sort of, like, throwback to olden times or old attitudes. It's just mu musicianship. And I think that way they avoid the vampirism of, uh, of this kind of press desire for the hot new young uh, uh, rock stars. I think a lot of what makes them so appealing is partly what they are not. Now, before I started this channel two years ago, I'd never watched a single music uh, video on YouTube or by any music critics. But in that time, I've, you know, in the last couple of years, I've been watching a lot. I'm curious to see what other people are saying. And uh, Rick Beato, a Rochester native, uh, does a lot of good videos about music theory and about the state of music. And like me, he's an old guy, uh, and he makes his comments about music, and sometimes he comes across a little bit okay boomer. And I saw this video that he did with a famous session guitarist, and at one point they just said, you know, music today is mostly just a celebrity and somebody with a laptop. And I think there's a, there's a good point that they're making there, that a lot of pop music is just one person with a laptop and then one celebrity singing over it. But this band, very much, I could see a lot of the hype around them coming from being the antithesis of this. We have seven musicians, all of them talented, all working together, a collective with absolutely no laptop, <laughs> just all musicianship. Also, this band does not make any kinds of concessions to pop or trying to be popular or make a hooky song at all. These songs are extremely long. It's a 40 minute album that is only six songs. To their credit, I think they could have easily divided this up into a bunch of pretentious parts, you know, like prog rock bands do, you know, like phase one, the, the winter skull of the griffin, and stuff like that. They don't do any of that. Uh, it's just one long song after another, and every song is so dense. I had to listen to the entire album with headphones in very carefully all the way through. Now, I also listened to it while walking around through my, so I had my iPod, my iPhone, iPod, iPhone in my jacket pocket, and I was walking around with my wife when we were talking, and it was good that way. I was listening to it while playing Donkey Kong, uh, Donkey Kong Country with my son, and it was also good that way. So it's an album that works both with intense listening and in the background, but you get the most of it by paying attention to the amount of texture and density to these songs, and the movement. Each of these very long songs has amazing movements. You don't know where it's going to end, and it starts somewhere. It seems like every song has an out intro and an outro and multiple, maybe even a couple outros, different parts. There aren't really choruses. There's maybe one or two songs with like a chorus, but they're not ever really trying to go for hooks. Now, I've been thinking about ways of doing something provocative with this video, and I don't like to be intentionally provocative, so I'm not going to title this Is Black Country New Road the New Led Zeppelin? <laughs> I was thinking about that, but this is the reason why. Um, whenever I think about Led Zeppelin, um, it's an interesting thing. You know, I was born, whatever, after they broke up, right, or during their last tour. And so I don't know what it was like when they started. But when they started, they were so hyped that that's why their, their musical publishing group is called Super Hype. Like, the whole world was ready for Led Zeppelin to release their first album. Now, this band isn't very much like Led Zeppelin, except I believe that in this sense of hype and in the sense of hope that, oh my God, the new hard rock gods from England are showing up, and now it's, oh my God, the new post-rock, I'll get to the genres later, the new great art rockers from England are showing up. But I do think there are some comparisons 
which will come in handy between Led Zeppelin and Black Country New Road. Now, if you're a super fan of the band and you're mad at me already, that's fine. You can put it in the comments. I think I'm going to justify it. One of the ways is that the vocalist, um, is, like the question is, can the musicianship, will the musicianship totally go way beyond the capacity of the vocalist? I would say that's one of the big fears about Led Zeppelin, right? Where you have these three amazing musicians at the top of their form, each one of them the best at what they do, and then you have a singer. And like, what's he gonna sing about? In Led Zeppelin's case, he's just gonna rip off a bunch of blues singers. Like, how is this, how can you possibly make this instrumental music better? It's really hard. So basically the job is how to not make it worse. Fortunately, the lead singer on here is doing a very good job. Uh, I think in particular the themes that he's choosing seems to be mostly about the band itself, very self-referential, which at times I think is problematic, um, but a lot more of it's about modern life and modern relationships and a lot of sort of modern technology. Um, but I believe that it is worthy of the music. I think the main way that I would say it's similar is that this album just simply lives up to whatever hype came into it. I bought this album. I had never heard of this album until last week when like five people told me to review it. I never heard of the band or anything. I bought it halfway through listening to it. It was kind of like back in the old days when you when you'd put on when you go to a record store and and you'd you know you'd like they'd have the the free samples at HMV or whatever and you'd put on the headphones and you'd listen to different tracks and then like you just hear something and you go that's it I'm gonna buy it. There's one point in this album, one specific moment, which I will tell you about stay tuned, where I heard it and I instantly went to Bandcamp and bought the album. It lives up to the hype, whatever it is that these poor young people have to deal with, <laughs> with this pressure, it seems as though they're doing it. Now I had some trouble describing the genre. I think that's part of their appeal. I think part of just where rock and roll is going right now is just this post-genre area. The most common genre I heard them called was post-rock, which is just obnoxious. I kind of want to spit at that definition in the face. Like, tuh, like, yuck, post-rock. I've heard it called klezmer rock. Apparently, uh, the one of the uh, songwriters is very inspired by klezmer music, which comes through in here. I'm just going to settle with post-punk. To me, it fits best in that area. Just a lot of the, the aesthetics of punk being the sort of a meat, like the, there's a certain rawness to it, um, but it's obviously much more musically developed than punk is. Uh, and But I don't know. At this point, we could just call it rock and roll. I think what's interesting about this band too is when I was in high school, a long, long time ago, there were very few bands that all of my friends would like. And I realized this is one of those bands. Like the only thing we could all agree on at one point was Radiohead. I don't mean like the Radiohead you're thinking of. I mean the bands. There was one point where the only thing all of my friends agreed on in 1996 before OK Computer was the bands. It was technical enough for my friends who liked music and were classically trained to like, you know, to like that. It was kind of disaffected and punky enough for me and my friends. This album has that appeal where I think if you're someone who goes to a music school and you take music super seriously and you're really into like, you know, Tool or Rush or prog rock, you'll like it. If you're really into kind of like loose jam bands or you're, you're into kind of like British post-punky disaffected stuff, you're going to like it. Even though this album never quite, never, clearly tries to be like, tries to be that way, never tries to reach out to everybody, uh, I think it actually has the ability to do it. I am hurting by the fact that I probably won't see this band live for a long time. It must be something, because there's seven musicians, and they're all very good, and they all interlace so well all the way throughout. Here's a question for you, if you're a, a, a black country New Roads fan. Not a great name for the band, by the way. This is not a good name. I mean, maybe that's intentional. It's not a good name. Also, it's not a good cover. It's like a weird cover. It's like a photograph with like a credit of who took the photograph, but it's not a good photograph. It's like three people walking up a hill and you can't really see who they are. Is this intentional? Am I missing the point? I might be missing the point. Okay, now let's go through track by track. Usually at this point, I tell you one song to listen to in order to understand what the song sounds, what the album sounds like. I'll get to that soon enough, but I just want to get into it. It starts off with a track called Instrumental. It's called Instrumental, and I think what I've been trying to say from the beginning is that the hardest thing this band can possibly do is have a singer that matches the awesomeness of their music. So it makes sense that they start off with this instrumental. 
This is, I, this is a total coincidence. A total coincidence. There's no connection between what I'm about to say and reality. How does the beginning, the first Led Zeppelin album start? Good times, bad times. Da -da. How does this album begin? Da -da. Okay, totally, totally unintentional. Just, I'm just being silly and stupid. Downvote this, it's fine. But it's uh, instrumental. Um, according to the band, um, there's a fair amount written by the band. They talk a lot about their music. It's not hard to find them talk about it. This was the first piece that they wrote. And I like that feeling that they sort of put it here at times they feel almost like a jam band, you know, like just bands that play together and can just play together for hours and hours uh, with cohesion, which when done well is beautiful as we have here. It's basically a drum solo for the beginning of the song, which leads into some great instrumental layering. There's like this loop on a keyboard, the drummer's just working and then these horns come in making these crazy sounds. The drummer's doing most of the work on this song as he does on multiple or maybe she, I don't know. The, the band seems to be 50-50 male and female. I don't know, don't particularly care which ones are male, which ones are female, so I'll just call them the drummer. Um, the song just goes places with each of these instruments. And this could easily be a 14 song album. This could easily be three or four songs here. But what really matters here, and what this introduction tells you, is what matters is the music. In a similar way, I reviewed Arlo Parks last week, and she started off her album with a poem, making it clear this is what matters. This is just, just, explaining this is what matters. It ends with this ridiculous crescendo, almost like a James Bond theme. Da -da -da, just so exciting. And then it leads in, at this point I was like kind of in. I was like, this is good, I like this. And then comes the next track, Athens, France. Weird title. 16 seconds in. This is not the moment that made me buy the album, but almost. 16 seconds in, just listen to the hi-hat, okay? Just listen, just listen to the hi-hat. He does this, this little, almost like Charlie Watts uh, of the Rolling Stones hi-hat, where it's at, like around the beat at the end of a measure. It's the only time I believe he does that on the entire, on the entire track. The drummer is just doing all these things. Basically, the drummer is writing a drum part in the same way that a guitarist writes a guitar part. God damn, I love this drummer. He is doing, or she is doing so much here. The guitar and the bass are basically just doing a loop while the drummer is just hustling so hard. Uh, no chorus here, just all these different parts. Like, a part sounds like it might be the chorus. I am very young, but I'm still working, working on the glow up. The glow up is a term that young people use nowadays, which means like when you all of a sudden become beautiful, I think. I don't know, I'm still, wait still waiting for my glow up. And then there's like some flutes and total silence. Many times on this album, you're like, oh, is it over? No, it's not over, just the silence. And then here, you know, this is the first song with lyrics, very delicate, mostly spoken, not particularly charismatic, which I think is good. I think if this singer were too much, were too much like a lot of the other post-punk singers, sort of like, you know, like getting that feel of the kind of guy that you know and you're just sort of attracted to and you don't quite know why, this doesn't feel like that. This feels more like a, a little more of a cerebral lead singer, which I think is a good thing mysterious lyrics. Apparently, there's an old version of this song and the first verse references the lyrics to the old version. I don't know. The outro on this song is one of the most beautiful parts on the album. It is not yet the point why I bought the album. Almost 90s like guitar work with single pick guitar notes in the left channel and then on the right channel you have them plugging along. You have to listen to this on headphones, it's so good. Then these horns come in and just sweep along the usage of horns on this album. And then the drummer goes back to work. So many dynamics. My friend Ted, I talk about a lot on this show, and he was really into emo before emo became something people would not say they were into. And what he always said was he liked was the dynamics. When I say that every member of my friend group would like this, that's why. Even like an emo kid who just likes Smashing Pumpkins and, and, and you know Promise Ring and all that, I think would react to the amount of dynamics that are in this record. And the lyrics are mostly really quite good. Uh, I like them, even though I don't fully understand them. Um, a lot of... A lot of kind of honest, like, reflections. Like, here's a quote. It's a one-size-fits-all, hardcore, cyber-fetish, early naughty zine. She sells matcha shots to pay for printing costs and a PR team. Seems to be much more related to the life of a young person who is trying to make their art work, which appears to be the primary theme. The primary theme, a young person trying to make their art work, a young person trying to make their love-like life work. 
and the first is way more successful than the second based on the lyrics. Next track is called Science Fair. This is cool because it starts with discordant notes. So, you know, like my friend Brad, who was super into pavement back in the 90s and who likes kind of discordant, wacky stuff like that, would, would like this very much, where these notes are just very talented drumming, but they sound like incidental notes. I think they're trying to sound unpracticed and fairly chaotic until settling into a very consistent chord. Structure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't have a script, but I have notes. And sometimes there's a bad, a bad page break. So I said, before settling into a consistent chord, structure. Um, speaking of Brad, he had a friend who used to put weird spaces like Christopher Walken in his speech. And the best thing he'd say was, turn the door, knob. Very odd. Anyways, great chord, stru uh, chord structure, punctuated by these amazing horns. Uh, more intentional discord between the ver verses that's funky and unsettling. And then this keyboard comes in. I don't, I don't get it. Like, this does make you angry. As an old man who tried to make music in his youth, why was I not this good? <laughs> because the, this keyboard, the only time I hear a keyboard like this on the album, there's plenty of keyboard work on the album, but like this keyboard sound, this is stabbing, menacing sound is very deliberately not a loop, slightly repetitive, but not a loop. And, and like the guitar, it like keeps building. And then comes the moment that I bought the album for. And this is what I want you to listen to. I want you to listen to the song Science Fair. And I want you to listen to this moment, four minutes and 27 seconds in. These horns come in. This weird melismatic horn line comes in, in the middle of this verse, absolutely out of nowhere. And it made me realize this album is jam-packed with these little moments where each of these seven members get to shine. Whether it's the drummer doing that hi-hat thing I'm talking about, or the singer having a good line, or the keyboard doing something special, or in this case, the horn coming in, Four minutes and 27 seconds in, I paused listening to it on title. I went to band camp, I bought the vinyl, and I went back to listening. It is just such a special moment. And you know, I'm not even, I'm gonna be, this is gonna be a long video, but I'm not even gonna get to everything because I know how dense this is. It's gonna take me a while and I'm trying to release it on the day that it comes out, but it'll probably come back later in some kind of best of, of the year, I imagine. The pre-outro has a great huge crescendo before more like, uh, like divided guitars in both ears. The, then the drums go into like a halftime with this funky sound, with these horns coming over. And it doesn't seem like it should coalesce, but it does. I suggest, and I'm going to, when I ask you to watch this video, I'll, I'll put a link up there to the video. Just a quick mo note about their videos. Their videos are all done by an American named Bart Price. My brother's name is Bart, and I've never met another Bart in my life. And he does these videos with, with I, iPhone videos and stock footage. And a little more digging, discover that he has a whole series of videos that are like stories based on using stock footage. Um, and it's called Courtney World. And it's really cool stuff. And I just, I think you should check it out. Especially because it seems like Black Country New Roads got their name. It seems like Black Country New Roads works with this person very carefully, and I think their aesthetics match up really, really well. Um, so I really like these videos, and also he filmed a lot of stuff in Oswego, New York, which is like an hour away from me. Um, the lyrics is really kind of funny in this one science fair, because uh, it's sort of about going to a science fair. She was impressed I could make so many things catch on fire. Uh, later, uh, the singer references another band, Slint, which according to all the articles I read, uh, I read is, this is what their music sounds like. I've never heard Slint. I didn't pay attention to music for 18 years up until I started this channel two years ago. So I'm sure they're great, but I'm happy to come into this not thinking about what they sound like. And no, I don't think they sound like Led Zeppelin. I think they might have some similar issues in relationship to expectations and the difficulty of having great musicians in a band. Okay. And then we get to the best lyrics. My favorite lyrics on the album, the point where I just, I just said, okay, they've, they've got it. This singer, this singer is worthy of the band that he is fronting. References, references, references. What are you on tonight? I love this city despite the preferences. What a time to be alive. There are 
many songs about the difficulties of being young and the life that we have now and the amount of choices that we have now and the consumer society and the way that it shapes us and the way that we have so many choices and preferences and how we can follow them and the ambiguity that we have towards it. This is, for lack of a better term, Generation X millennial thinking. So it's much like Generation X had the world in front of them and then just sort of said, Ugh, I don't know, whatever. Having all these choices, having all this on-demand life in front of you leaves you just sort of, eh, leaves you saying, ironically, half ironically, what a time to be alive. He then refers to black country. I, what? Multiple times on this album, they reference Black Country, which is the name of the band. I get that it's some part of England, a fairly industrial part of England. Why? What, what's it about? It, what I suspect is that the singer doesn't always have something to say and that he often just writes lyrics along with the music um, and that he doesn't like spend a lot of time writing lyrics. And so Black Country is just an evocative thing. I can't quite tell. The next track, Sunglasses, starts off with a great Neil Young sounding guitar intro, just basically a grumbly guitar, and then almost like a prog rock drum beat. Uh, you know, my friends who were really into prog rock at the time uh, would appreciate this bit. Simple kind of guitar line and great trademark embellishes with all these weird sort of sounds. Almost even sounds like Tool at points. Again, I'm not saying they sound like Tool, but just like a kind of single note guitar with an unexpected time signature, you can't help but feel that way. Uh, lyrically, he says the song is based on the idea of uh, that you are more comfortable wearing sunglasses while walking down the street. That's, that's great. I feel that way too. That's a simple, interesting way to describe the kind of alienation that you can put on yourself to distance yourself from other people. But the lyrics get more interesting in the first verse. And I'm going to read you this whole first verse. In particular, this concept of becoming your mother's father. It's, 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 it's really complicated. But if you have relationships with women who have complicated relationships with their father, you often end up playing the role of their father. This happens more often in relationships than it does with your mother. But still, it's an interesting thing to like replay family trauma for women by representing things about their father. I've been in this position many times in my life, and it's nobody's fault. It's just human psychology. It's just humans, human nature. And I think that this band deserves a lot of credit for pointing this out. Mother is juicing watermelons on the breakfast island. And with frail hands, she grips the Nutribullet. And the bite of its blades reminds me of a future I am in no way a part of. And in a wall of photographs in the downstairs second living room TV's area, I become her father. And complain of mediocre theater in the daytime and ice in a single malt whiskey at night or rising skirt hems, lowering IQs. All things aren't built like they used to be the absolute pinnacle of British engineering. So here, he's seeing himself becoming old, behaving old, behaving in the same kind of reproving manner that his grandfather did. It's just beautiful. And then that leads into this chorus, which is the only real chorus on the album, him repeating a line over and over again, I'm so ignorant now with all that I've learned. I don't know how to interpret this line. I would like your interpretation of this line, YouTube viewer. I am so ignorant now of all that I have learned. I am obsessed with ignorance. It's one of my favorite things to talk about because I am so ignorant of so much music that I talk about with my, my professorial authority, right? I'm interested with this. Is this being said ironically or is this how young people think of old people? I don't know. Now, I don't know why this isn't two different songs. I think the first song could be called mother's father and then this song the second part could be sunglasses because there's this whole meltdown after that course a jazzy meltdown and then it gets picked up again with a guitar and then all of a sudden the drums are doing a, a, a simple beat on the two and four so the total prog rock drum beat at the beginning before becomes two and four you know and it builds beautifully in these lyrics about being invincible in sunglasses and it just keeps adding elements until the drums actually invert and then the saxophones come in, and then the chorus comes back. Almost traditional structure, I guess, in some ways. Uh, now there's some violin in here, and then he just keeps saying this line, I am more than adequate, leave Kanye out of this. Can you believe it? Even Kanye gets mentioned in this album. No wonder I bought it. It just builds so nicely with these lines about like taking SSRIs and leaving Kanye out of it, and I am more than adequate, and it builds up and more horn, he starts to yell, and I want to see this band in concert. 
but I'm not going to. And there's a, at least not for a while, a weird ascending, descending outro. Almost done with this album yet. Whew. What an album, right? You get the sense I'm, I'm, I'm communicating. Like the amount of energy, the, the density of this album. Track X is the next one. According to them, this is the direction that the band is going in. And this doesn't sound that different from the rest of the album to me. It still bears all the, tra all the trademarks of interesting instances with different instruments and layering and interesting sounds and all that. But it's still, it's got this nice delicate guitar line that slides up and down, has this, guitar, this saxophone that kind of bloops about, along with some violin that bloops about, and then some piano kind of goes all over the place in stereo. As with much of their stuff, it is fragmented and cohesive all at the same time. It actually reminds me of Philip Glass in a lot of ways. A lot of these kind of weird arpeggiated sounds going on. Um, the violin goes from being plucked to being bowed just before the chorus. And then the chorus, it's a new, it's a new road moment in the chorus. Another one of these moments that when I heard it, after having spent the $30 to have the damn album shipped from England, uh, I said to myself, good. Because <laughs> there's this moment where a female vocalist comes in. Where was she the whole album? You know, we have this like kind of, not sort of, but fairly typical slackery sounding young male singing the whole way through. All of a sudden we have this female vocalist who's matched with a keyboard sound. And we have this chorus that's hardly anything. It's just, I guess in some way. That's the line, I guess in some way. Uh, it's intentionally vague. I think it's intentionally left off to be filled in by you. The verses are not very clearly connected. The first one is about Isaac and Abraham. I almost brought my copy of Fear and, uh, uh, Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard, because um, I don't know if it's a reference to Kierkegaard, who talks a lot about the, the parable of Isaac and a Abraham, and you know the father was going to sacrifice his son, and then when he comes down, the, it's replaced with a goat by an angel. Um, Dylan also spoke a little bit about that. He also mentions Dylan a couple times. Although I read somewhere that's the name of his dog. I don't know if that's on purpose. Um, but then the second verse seems to be about like the scene. Based on what I read, there's like a seat, there's like a club in Brixton, which I only know from the clash. Ah, uh, Gonza, Brixton. So I, I, yeah, I, I don't know where Brixton is. I assume it's near London or something. Uh, but they are very much of a scene stir band, it seems like. Like based on most of the stuff that I've read, they mention this club like every single time and the other people that play there and he mentions other people that play there. Um, but I don't know, you know, why not? I mean, it's nice to have a scene and if it's like this, if it's producing music like this, then that's all good. Uh, and then we get to the final track, Opus. Very pretentious title. For an album that could be very pretentious, it's not, except for this title. It just means work, right? Musical work. But still, it's great. It's actually horn-led for the first time. This definitely sounds the most like klezmer music, although I don't know klezmer music that well. Um, what's interesting about this is that this has like this descending line, um, and then it almost again goes back almost into that tool territory, that kind of like prog, hard-rocking sound without actually trying to sound like it. Um, the lyrics are mostly about the band. According to what I read, this song was written at the same time as the instrumental, so it's kind of like a beginning and an end, and so it's intentionally, this album feels like the main thing the album is about is about the album. So it makes sense that the final song is called Work because that's what this whole thing is. Um, uh, after the first verse, it gets even more kind of danceable klezmer sounds, just some psychotically sick riffs everywhere. Uh, and just this is where like you really start to wonder if this person writes lyrics at all or if he just goes in and sings. Uh, because it feels as though a lot of things are repeated. Now everybody's coming up. I guess I should have something else to say. Uh, you know, I used to be, <laughs> I was in a band for a long time. One time we had the idea of having a show where we didn't write any songs before the show. It was at Mass Art in Boston. We were just going to improvise all the songs and just sing. We just figure out the lyrics when we were there. It went very poorly, and almost all the lyrics were like, I don't know what to say, I've got no words today, you know. Um, and, and then Keith started singing about dragons a lot. Yeah, that was weird. Um, but still, I don't think that's a bad thing because 
it reminds you again of how important the music is and how the music is at the heart of it. It really is about the instrumentals. The album ends with the line, what we, must bu what we built must fall into the rising flames. I don't know if they're trying to say that this is like, I think, I think what they're trying to say is that this is the end of the band as this is, and the next thing they're going to do is something else that's very big. My hope is that they take all this insane hype and attention and love and just keep building on it. Like, like do that. Like, make this album an anomaly and then make everything sound like however they think track X sounds different and just kind of keep working and just use this ridiculous hype to their advantage to have artistic freedom. That's, you know, when British bands are the best, right? When they get to just do things that, that, uh, that they want to do knowing that they don't have these commercial demands uh, breathing down their neck. Okay, well there it is. There's my review. It's been a big week for music. I'm gonna do like three or four reviews this week because there's so much. But I wanted to get this out there. What what do you think about the album? I am curious. Like, um, are people disappointed by this? Is this gonna be the first post punk album I've reviewed where most of the people aren't gonna be like, I thought it was gonna be better based on what they did before? Because this is awesome. Okay. Well, for Joe Cool and for my brother who's coming over soon, he's getting out of work. He works at a bank. Well, we're probably going to go sledding in my backyard. Two dudes in their 40s going sledding. Ah, I gotta love Rochester. All right, there's the camera.